Pearl Harbor was a turning point in history. A monument to the battleship Arizona commemorates the beginning of America's involvement in the Second World War. While the USS Missouri represents its end. A much smaller memorial consists of two simple circles of stones honoring what many consider to be the single most effective military service in the war against Japan, the submarine force of the United States Navy. The American submarine campaign during the Second World War was the most absolutely decisive victory of that war. The submariners in the Pacific reduced the Japanese Imperial Navy and its merchant fleet to near non-existence. A short distance away from the memorial stones is the USS Bofin, a survivor of the conflict, preserved now in her wartime condition as another monument to American submariners. Curious visitors come in peace today, but in her prime, the Bofin was a warrior, traveling nearly a hundred thousand miles on nine war patrols, sinking more than 67,000 tons of Japanese shipping. But such victories are not won without sacrifice. There are 52 stones at the Pearl Harbor Submarine Memorial representing the 52 boats lost in action during World War II and the 3,505 men who perished with them. The American submarine force relied on stealth and secrecy. It was vital that enemy ships, once struck, never knew it was a sub that hit them. The operations of American submarines were largely secret, and they became known collectively as the Silent Service. The letters SS in the Bofin's official hull number identify her as a submarine. The numerals show she was the 287th sub to enter the U.S. Navy since the force was founded with the commissioning of the USS Holland in 1900. Bofin and the other boats of her time represented the pinnacle of American submarine technology, which was slow to grow but luckily peaked just before the Second World War, at the critical moment when it was needed the most. Two decades earlier in the First World War, Germany had proved the submarine could be a deadly weapon, with such sinkings as the civilian ocean liner Lusitania. The rest of the world, however, recoiled from this indiscriminate warfare. And at that time, there was a great abhorrence of submarine warfare, uh, particularly the unrestricted type. It was considered almost cowardly to attack and sink unarmed merchant ships or even ones that had a deck gun. In the 1920s, Arms Limitations Treaties officially declared unrestricted attacks to be immoral. The operational doctrine for submarines was known as the cruiser rules. The cruiser rules meant that the submarine had to surface, accost the merchant ship, inspect its cargo or whatever, and then put the crew in a place of safety. This political climate between the wars threw naval planning into confusion. If stealth attacks were unacceptable, how else could submarines be used? Prior to the World War II submarines, and some years before World War II started, there was quite a discussion in the Navy as to the proper employment of our submarines. And it was decided that the battleship was the backbone of the Navy. The idea was that the submarines were adjuncts to the battle line. And they were to help the battle line. And so what was the mission of the submarine? Well, it was to scout ahead of the fleet. And that's why they had to be called fleet submarines. Prior to the mid-1920s, American submarines have been small, awkward, and ineffective. But now, to keep up with the fleet, subs needed 20-knot speeds and long-range capabilities. This demanded designs for boats exceeding 300 feet in length. At 1,500 tons or more, the boats would double the weight of their predecessors. 
but there was a weak link. American diesel engines of the 1920s simply didn't measure up. We could not manufacture a diesel that was reliable enough over the long term, which could provide a submarine on the surface with 20 knots plus in order to sustain, to sustain the pace of a battle fleet. It couldn't be done. But in the early 1930s, the American railway industry was spearheading improvements in diesel technology designed to replace steam power on American trains. A fortunate coincidence for the Navy, similar engines were ideal for submarines. One of the things you have to remember about submarines is that they have to have two power sources, one for submerged operations, which is all electric, and one for surface operations, and that's the diesel engine. An efficient new arrangement no longer geared diesels directly to the propellers as in earlier subs. Now the engines drove generators full time, feeding current to electric motors which turned the propellers instead. Large banks of batteries provided the power when the sub was submerged and the diesels had to be shut down. By the time of 1934, we really had a submarine that had almost all the characteristics of the fleet boat that did serve during the war. And from then on, it was a case of improvement and refinement. Among those refinements were features to make the crew comfortable on long voyages, because the next military opponent facing Navy submarines was undoubtedly Japan. If the Navy's major task was to patrol the Pacific, it needed a submarine that had long sea legs, could accommodate a large crew, could sustain them over time, could provide clean air and good food, and good drinking water. And the design had to be like that. In 1939, plans for the USS Gato were in progress. With war on the horizon, its design became the fixed standard for mass production. The Gato-class subs were 312 feet long and carried a crew of 80. They could make 19 knots on the surface, dive 300 feet, and were equipped for journeys of 10,000 miles or more. The American fleet submarine had come of age. I think they were the best built submarines in the world. Barring none, Germans, anybody else, we had the best. Ours were Cadillacs. We all had our own bunk. We had three good meals a day and we had a clean boat, we had a good crew, we had water, well, we'll take a bath once a week. And uh, they were very reliable and dependable. But the first of the Gato-class subs would fail to be ready in time to do the job for which they were designed. World War II was about to begin. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, battleships and airfields were the prime targets. Unnoticed or ignored were the submarines, whose crews were among the first Americans to fight back. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, there were a number of submarines alongside the dock in the submarine base. They, of course, immediately went to general quarters, as all the ships did, and they ran up on deck and got their guns and tried to shoot at the airplanes. A remarkable set of photographs offers a seldom seen view of the attack. The submarine Narwhal, at anchor with the explosive clouds of black smoke rising from mortally wounded battleships in the background. On deck, sailors survey the attack in disbelief. The Union Jack flutters in a breeze on the narwhal's bow as a Japanese plane streaks out of the sky toward them. The narwhal, together with the submarine Tortog and a nearby destroyer, were given group credit for shooting down the first of 29 Japanese planes destroyed in the raid. On this day of infamy, however, their efforts were barely noticed. They didn't 
do much good because these submarines were not intended to be anti-aircraft ships. They did man their stations and they did well for themselves and the planes did not attack them, therefore there were no submarines damaged at Pearl Harbor. The submarine Pompano, built in 1937, had been scheduled to arrive at Pearl Harbor from the mainland that very morning. But rough weather had made her four hours late. A young officer, Roger Payne, was on board. The message that we got, plain language, was, this is no drill, attack on Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. And that was really the only word that we had for quite a while. With cautious war procedures suddenly in place, the Pompano did not reach her destination for another two days. It was a very shocking thing indeed to enter Pearl Harbor and to see battleship row in the shambles, bodies actually floating in the water still. This was two days after the event. The pre-war rules of restraint and political courtesy under which all subs had previously operated were suddenly gone. When the Japanese hit us at Pearl Harbor, that wiped all the rules off the books. We got a piece of paper signed by Admiral Nimitz directing our skipper to use unrestricted submarine warfare, sink ships of any kind whenever he found them. I was cheery. I was emotionally affected by the, what I saw as the quality of my leadership. At the start of the Second World War, there were only 55 American submarines in the Pacific, split between Pearl Harbor and the Philippines. A number of these were the obsolete S-class boats, built in the early 1920s, and useful for little more than training. The others, like the Pompano, were advanced, but developmental fleet subs. The new mass-produced Gato-class boats were yet to be completed. When the USS Gato was commissioned three weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor, it signaled the beginning of a massive building program that would put 221 new fleet submarines into duty before the end of the war. In 1943, the Gato class would be succeeded by the Baleo class subs. Nearly identical in appearance, they were equipped with heavier hulls and called thick skin boats allowing dives to 400 feet, 100 feet deeper than the thin skins. As America mobilized for war, the unique role of the submarine with its cutting-edge technology attracted the finest of crews. The Pacific Fleet was in shambles, and only the boats of the silent service remained to draw the battle lines. We were fortunate during World War II. Lots of people wanted to get into submarines for different reasons. But the main one was that the submarine was carrying the war to the Japanese at the time, while our surface forces in the beginning of the war were you know, rebuilding in order to be able to carry the battle to the final conclusion. There were a lot of people who, even though they didn't have an engineering education, were very, very interested in what made things tick. And there were a lot of things on board a submarine that ticked and needed taken care of. The fleet subs of World War II were ingenious fighting machines. Inside their engine rooms, four massive diesels cranked out 5,400 horsepower each, all converted instantly into electricity. In the next compartment was the maneuvering room, where the electric current was switched to drive motors or charge batteries, or any combination of the two. When you operated, Normally you'd be on the surface and you would run your engines, but your engines would also keep the battery charged up. Submerged, however, you'd discharge the battery, the engine would be stopped. If you ran for one hour at high speed, you'd be discharged, or you could go at very slow speed for as long as 48 hours before you're fully discharged. But at that point, you had to recharge your battery. The only way we could do it was to surface the submarine and run the diesel engines. A full battery charge could take up to eight hours. So the safest time to do it was at night, when the sub was least visible to the enemy. At the very center of the submarine was the control room, 
containing the valves, gauges, levers and handles to accomplish the dive and surface, the very essence of the sub's existence. We practiced this a lot and we thought of all sorts of different stratagems to increase our diving speed to the point where the trigger, which was my first submarine, we got her down to 30 seconds during the war. Immediately above the control room was the conning tower, the part of the boat located inside the superstructure that gave all the World War II subs their distinctive silhouette. Here the course of the boat was directed as she was put into battle. This was home to the helm, the boat's steering wheel, as well as its eyes, the periscopes. High-tech gear was crowded into every corner. Sonar to listen for targets and radar installed after the start of the war for an electronic fix on Japanese vessels. There was even a special torpedo data computer or TDC, a mechanical calculator that automatically tracked a target and aimed the torpedoes. Those were fired from the two torpedo rooms with six tubes forward and four tubes aft. They carried a great load of torpedoes. They carried 24 torpedoes. We could reload them quite quickly. So they were the ideal ship for that purpose. I call them ships because I think they indeed should be ships, but they were called boats by everybody. Boats was a leftover from the days when submarines were small and insignificant, demeaned by surface sailors. Now these subs held the key to victory, and the designation boats became a badge of honor. In drawing the noose around enemy shipping, American submariners would encounter enough danger and adventure to make them legendary for years to come. Of all the stories involving American submarines in the Second World War, none is stranger than that of the sister ships Sculpin and Squalus. Their tale involves each in a drama concerning the other's survival and destruction. The saga begins in early 1939, at a time when events were leading the world to a war that was still months away. The Sculpin and Squalus were commissioned 45 days apart at the naval shipyard in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Their designs were virtually identical. They were among just 10 American subs built that year. Still too early for the accelerated construction programs, which the war made essential. On May the 23rd, 1939, the Squalus was on a training run off the northeast US coast near the Isles of Shoals, barely 15 miles out from the Navy Yard in Portsmouth. As she prepared to execute a standard test dive, something went disastrously wrong. On that particular dive, everything went according to plan. But for some mysterious reason, which has never been explained, the main induction vent opened letting a cascade of ocean water into the engine rooms of the submarine. Many people don't realize what the main induction is. It's a huge pipe as big as 36 inches in diameter to take air into the submarine to run the diesel engines. Now, uh, the four engines on the submarine have to all run at the same time sometimes, and they all need air at the same time, so that's why you need that big of a pipe. It's a huge pipe. In the control room, attention during the dive was focused on what submariners called the Christmas tree, a panel of red and green lights showing the status of all the openings on the boat, including the main induction. But inside the engine room, a huge column of water was suddenly pouring in through the big pipe. We know it was open because water came in. But we also have testimony from all the people in the control room that that was shut and they saw the green board. They saw the light was green, not red. The sub would sink in a matter of minutes. Water rushing into the engine room killed nearly half the crew immediately. A quick 
but agonizing death. I just know that they all had enormous pain, enormous, and it ruptured their eardrums immediately and probably blanked most of them out. They were probably unconscious because of the tremendous pressure that hit them that fast. Survivors rushed to close the submarine's watertight doors, isolating the flooded compartments behind secure bulkheads. 33 men found themselves stranded in the forward part of the boat. They were 240 feet below the surface of the icy Atlantic and had no idea how many hours would pass before they would be missed. When the Squalus failed to report in after its test dive, her sister ship, the Sculpin, was dispatched to look for her. The Sculpin found the Squalus by sighting its emergency rescue buoy, with which all subs were equipped. With Sculpin leading the way, ships, men and equipment converged on the scene. But the Navy had an ace, a new diving bell, invented by Commander Alan R. McCann. It was rushed to the scene aboard the rescue ship Falcon. In a hazardous operation, the bell was sent to save the lives of men who would otherwise be doomed. You sort of glued to the radio. We didn't have TV, so we were all following as best we could how these people might be rescued. And there was a tremendous feeling of wonder and awe when, in fact, they brought up a large number of the crew. The first bell brought up seven crewmen, and it was almost miraculous to the press covering it that, for the first time in history, crewmen were brought up from great depth from a submarine. It was almost unbelievable. Cables went out across the country and gigantic headlines were generated in newspapers everywhere. Though 26 men were killed, all 33 who remained alive in the forward part of the boat were saved. In the inquest that followed, no conclusions were reached on the cause of the Squalus accident. The mystery of the main induction failure remains unsolved. People have theorized over what happened, and I have my own theory. No proof, just my idea. The chief in charge, a checked out sailor, he'd been in submarines for years, must have somehow opened the induction when he meant to open some other valve. He probably grabbed the wrong handle and opened the induction. You can do a thing a million times correctly, that's the time you're gonna make a mistake. You have gotta realize you get stale when you're doing something. So you don't do it routinely. You gotta remember that this kind of a thing, you do it unroutinely every time. Two months later, the sea off the Isles of Shoals was crowded once more, as salvage ships converged on the site to raise the sunken Squalus. The Sculpin was on hand again, her destiny still linked closely to her sister ship. When President Franklin Roosevelt saw pictures of the Squalus as her nose leapt from the water, he likened her to a sailfish. That description would become the new name of the ill-fated boat after it was restored and put back into service. But cynical, superstitious sailors thought this sub would forever be cursed. They nicknamed it the Squalefish. When America entered World War II, so did the Sculpin and the Sailfish. For two years, the boats were sent on routine patrols in the Pacific until, in 1943, fate and the Japanese once again reunited the sisters. In November of that year, Captain John P. Cromwell was aboard the Sculpin, coordinating a three-sub wolf pack near Truck Island, then a major Japanese base. Suddenly, the sub was attacked by an enemy destroyer. Depth charges damaged the Sculpin beyond recovery. The Sculpin was at the limit of its battery charge. There was no way it could stay under the surface any longer without dooming the crew. So the skipper decided to scuttle the boat. The Sculpin had to sink herself to avoid falling into enemy hands. Cromwell, as the Wolfpack commander, 
now faced an agonizing decision. He was aware of a planned top secret American strike on the Gilberts, a thousand miles to the east. His capture could put the entire strike in jeopardy. He is recorded as having said, I'm sorry, I can't go with you. I cannot take the chance of getting, being put on dope or torture that I couldn't take or something to cause me to tell information that I have known. Therefore, I must stay aboard. And he did. He went down in the wardroom and just simply sat there until the ship sank. John P. Cromwell was awarded the Medal of Honor for his sacrifice. The Sculpin was lost, but 41 of its crew survived. Captured by the enemy, they were put aboard the aircraft carriers Chuyo and Unyo, bound for Japan. It was here that the sailfish, formerly called the Squalus, entered the Sculpin story once again. The Sculpin prisoners were below decks on the two carriers as they headed into a typhoon off the coast of Japan. It was the same area that the sailfish was assigned to in seeking out enemy vessels. Due to the violent storm, the sub could not actually see its target. Only radar revealed the presence of a large enemy vessel. The sailfish attacked the Choyo and sank it not realizing that 21 Sculpin prisoners were on board. Among the 21 Sculpin prisoners, only one survived. It was not until the end of the war that investigators could piece together the strange story of the two boats. Years would pass before the lone survivor of the Sculpin learned the deadly torpedo had come from the sailfish, sister ship to his own. As the United States rushed to put its newest submarines into production at the beginning of the Second World War, the Navy was forced to make the best use of its existing boats as well. Among the 55 subs scattered across the Pacific when the war began were three extraordinary giants, the Argonaut, the Narwhal, and the Nautilus. Designed in the late 1920s, they were part of the then current V-class boats and were the largest submarines built by the U.S. Navy until the advent of nuclear power in the 1950s. Biggest of the three was the Argonaut, the only American submarine designed specifically as a mine layer. Her aft torpedo tubes were replaced with special mine laying hardware. At 387 feet, this made her 10 feet longer than her sister ships and 75 feet longer than the mainstream fleet subs of World War II. But the great size of the Argonaut and her sisters also put them at a disadvantage. Well, as it turned out, they didn't have enough power. They were low powered, so they didn't have the speed they should have had. The diesel engines that we later put in our submarines were not available for them at the time. So these subs were slow, unwieldy, they simply were not very effective submarines. Even prior to the war, America's big subs had achieved fame. The Argonaut, for instance, became a movie star. In 1931, John Ford sat on her deck to direct his film entitled Beneath the Sea. The Argonaut was given a special paint job and the number U-172. The submarine played the movie role of a large German U-boat, which her basic design closely resembled. Four years later, in 1935, when child actress Shirley Temple visited Pearl Harbor, it was the Argonaut she toured. No lesser sub would do. Of all the three big boats, only the Narwhal docked at Pearl Harbor faced the enemy directly on the first day of the war. The Argonaut and Nautilus were on patrol near Midway Island. Although they saw no action on that day, the Nautilus would play a key role in the Battle of Midway seven months later. The Nautilus was, with a lot of other submarines, was deployed around Midway Island with the idea that uh, some of them would be in place if the Japanese made the landing attack on Midway, which we expected. 
On June the 4th, 1942, the Nautilus made contact with Japanese warships. After launching an unsuccessful attack, the Saab watched the enemy fleet turn north, leaving one destroyer behind to counterattack. This tactic proved a fatal mistake for the Japanese. And after depth charging for a while, the destroyer took off and headed north. It just so happened that Commander McCluskey, an aviator, was out with the dive bombers. He was in charge of this flight, and they had lost contact. They had no idea where the Japanese were. So he saw a destroyer heading north at high speed, and he said, well, why is that guy heading north? There's only one reason I can think of. He wants to rejoin the main force, and we'll follow him. So McCluskey followed the destroyer that had been depth charging the Nautilus, and sure enough, in a short time, there was the Japanese fleet dead ahead. When McCluskey arrived, there was no air cover over these carriers. And he just simply attacked as soon as he could. And they released their bombs and two hit the Akagi and the others were all hit equally. And so it was the debacle of the Battle of Midway. It happened in five minutes. Three weeks later, the Nautilus again made history. She was sent to a spot near the entrance of Tokyo Bay to bombard the summer palace of Emperor Hirohito. Alone among the submarines, the big boats had the right equipment for the job. They were built with large six-inch guns, biggest, biggest submarine guns we've ever had. And they were, developed great accuracy with those guns. Danger in the Japanese waters prevented the Nautilus from attempting the surface attack. Instead, she found another target. On June the 26th, 1942, the Nautilus tracked, torpedoed, and sank the Japanese destroyer Yamakaze. An extraordinary event because of this photo. I happen to, be, to have been a friend of a man named Ozzie Lynch, who was aboard the Nautilus, and he was a phot photographic nut of the sort. But he had invented a means of getting pictures through the periscope, which we believed had been told it was impossible. But Ozzie Lynch, being one of these characters who doesn't believe what he's told, uh, tried it and it worked. This was the first combat photograph taken through the periscope of an American submarine. It was published in Life magazine and was used repeatedly as a morale booster, a rare break from the heavy secrecy of the submarine force. The picture was released two months after the fact. Navy censors mentioned neither the submarine's name nor where the photo was taken. One of the things about that picture, which uh, is a little, a little surprising, if you look at the water line, you see that the horizon is at an angle. Not only is the ship sinking, but the water is sinking too. And uh, that is because the uh, people who took the picture and had it developed and put it out for publication, they couldn't let well enough alone. They had to improve it. And if you look at the picture, you see, that, hey, come on, guys, that isn't the way it really was. You have to turn the picture to see the way it really ought to be. Despite these successes, the slow speed of the Nautilus, Narwhal and Argonaut made them better suited to special missions than lone patrols. A young officer named Philip Eckhart was on the Argonaut in August of 1942 when just such orders were given. We were told to get out to the Pearl Harbor at, at best speed. And they had a special mission in the offing for us and we didn't know what, what it was. The mission cast the Argonaut and Nautilus as transports for the U.S. Marines. They carried Carlson's raiders to their daring attack on Makin Island, destroying the Japanese garrison in a diversion to the American invasion of Guadalcanal, 1,200 miles away. Nine months later, another special mission. The Nautilus, this time with the Narwhal, transported 214 Army scouts to take part in the American operation to drive the Japanese from the Aleutian island of Attu. Philip Eckert had transferred to the Nautilus from the Argonaut prior to the Attu raid. It was while serving aboard his new ship he heard about the loss of his old one. In January 1943, the Argonaut had been sent east of New Guinea near the Solomon Islands. 
I just feel that the Argonaut was sent into extremely dangerous waters, keeping in mind what her configuration was, namely no after torpedo tubes. After torpedo tubes are 25 to 45 percent of your firepower, and they didn't have them. The Argonaut's aft torpedo tubes had been replaced with the specialized hardware she needed for her original design as a mine layer. Though she performed well in taking Marines to Macon Island, she had never been on a true war patrol, seeking enemy ships to sink. A Japanese destroyer proved her undoing. They depth charged him, and the Argonaut is reported, by the Japanese actually, to have surfaced. Their bow came out of water at a sharp angle. The destroyer is close aboard, pumped it full of shells, and she sank. Her stone at the Pearl Harbor Memorial records a loss deeply felt amongst submariners. The Argonaut, as big as she was, carried more crew than any other American sub. 106 men died when she went down the single greatest submarine loss of World War II. By mid-1944, the war was going well for the American Navy. Preparations were being made to retake the islands of Guam, Saipan, and Tinian in the Marianas. A thousand miles to the west of those islands, submarines were sent to patrol the San Bernardino Straits in the Philippines. There, they hoped to sight the Japanese mobile force, a fleet of ships expected to oppose the American offensive. Locating the enemy was essential. And the Japanese forces came through San Bernardino Straits. It was a long way to go to make an engagement with the American forces. For several days, they were unsighted. Nobody knew where they were. Zeke Zelmer was an officer aboard the USS Kavala, a new submarine on its very first war patrol. Cavallo was built at Connecticut's Electric Boat Company and was commissioned on February the 29th in the leap year 1944. Her men called her their lucky lady. For sailors superstitious reasons, we felt that the 29th of February was very auspicious and would bring luck to Our Lady, Our Lady the Cavallo. But the crew scarcely knew how lucky she'd be as they searched for the Japanese mobile force off the Philippines their first time out. Through the sonar system came the telltale sounds of enemy ships. Kavala saw some ships, heard some noises, submerged, and found themselves with a mobile force coming at them. Ideal situation for a submarine commander. Sink them all. But skipper Herman Kosler did nothing. Unknown to his crew, his orders were to report first, shoot second. Herman did his duty. He did not fire. He let the carriers and all these magnificent juicy targets go by, and they didn't know he was there. And he simply then surfaced, got his antenna out of water at any rate, and sent the report. It turned out to be one of the decisive reports of that battle. Frankly, the crew and uh, the officers as well were devastated. Here we had the ideal target on our first patrol. We counted at least 15 ships by sonar. We had seen some seven ships, including carriers and cruisers. And we just sat there as quietly as we could, listened to them, and let them go. So there was terrible disappointment. Morale was probably at the lowest ebb I saw it on the Kalaw. But Zelma and the crew would not be disappointed for long. With the Japanese now located, the orders were changed. Shoot first, report second. Before long, ships appeared on the horizon. One of them, a large aircraft carrier. Now the important thing to know was, are they Japanese or are they American? The last thing we wanted to do was to sink an American carrier. So it is imperative that we have a positive identification before we went in and made our final attack. The ship in the periscope was the Japanese carrier Shokaku. Although the Kavala's crew did not yet know it, to all appearances, it could have been one of their own. 
The shokaku was unlike most Japanese carriers. It had a large island on the deck, as do our carriers. Most of the other Japanese carriers were more flush deck, and so we had the one that was the easiest to confuse with an American carrier. The Cavallo was closing fast, and the skipper still could not identify the carrier. The executive officer took a look, then the fire control officer. They desperately scrutinized their ship recognition manual. Time was running out. We're now getting closer to the target, and we're going to have to make a decision. Skipper raises the scope, takes another observation, and we're now close enough. The ensign stands out. And he says, there's a meatball on the end. It's Japanese. We'll fire on the next observation. We proceeded for the next three minutes. Fired six torpedoes at 1,200 yards. Three of them hit. The Kavala and her crew remained submerged, avoiding attacks from Japanese destroyers. Sounds of the enemy depth charges grew faint as she edged out of the area. And then we heard four very large explosions in the distance. These were not left depth charges because they continued to rumble. It was an explosion and a lot of noise. And we thought that spelled the end of the carrier. Zelma and the Kavala crew were elated. Even more so when, long afterwards, they realized that the Shokaku was one of the carriers that participated in the attack on Pearl Harbor. Well, when one's elated with what one accomplishes during the war, and then when you put the little frosting on the cake as well, you know, you get an extra feeling of satisfaction. A little payback, if you will. The Kavala was one of the two American subs to sink aircraft carriers prior to what became the first battle of the Philippine Sea. The Japanese Navy entered the action so weakened, it was a lopsided American victory, forever known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Today, Zeke Zelma is a frequent visitor to his old boat. The USS Kavala sits in a state of disrepair at a naval memorial park in Galveston, Texas. One of 15 wartime subs still surviving, there are plans to restore her to the condition in which she served so well. As for the boats that succumbed in battle, the memorial at Pearl Harbor reminds us that submariners never consider them lost. The uh, submarine way of saying that a submarine is lost is that she's on eternal patrol. Uh, this means that she's down there with her crew on board and they're serving their country and will forever. They can't do anything else. Their lives are ended. Submarines are wrecked, but they're serving their country.